This is a production of Cornell University. So, so my um, my talk today is about the Native Hawaiian Beginning Farmer Program, um, and I would like to acknowledge my two colleagues, Alton Arakaki and Jennifer Hawkins. Um, Alton and I have worked on Molokai together for about 28 years. Uh, well, actually more than that, 38 years. Uh, he just retired two years ago. Um, he's been working with the Native Hawaiian community before I started this job. So that was really a, a positive for us being able to have uh, almost 60 years of experience working, 70 years of experience working with the Hawaiian community. Um, Jennifer Hawkins, uh, is from Arkansas, was in extension for 15 years, came over to uh, Molokai and added the Southern draw to our program, uh, fit in very well, uh, communicates very well with the Native Hawaiian community. And she plays a very important role in evaluation uh, and even counseling of our farmers. Okay, next. So this is um, at my homestead. I grow taro and bananas and all kinds of stuff. Um, my wife is a fifth generation Hawaiian homesteader. Their families moved here when the land was set aside back in the 1920s. Um, this was part of the Hawaiian Homes Act. When Captain Cook so-called so discovered Hawaii, there were probably about a half a million Hawaiians. Uh, by 1870, there were only 70,000 Hawaiians left. Um, and this was from all the introduced diseases, um, influenza, measles, and, and especially smallpox. So uh, a program was developed. Uh, uh, we had a prince, Prince Kuhil, who was in Congress and was able to set aside a program to repatriate the Native Hawaiians. And 200,000 acres was set aside um, for this purpose. Next. Here are my two colleagues outstanding in their field. We have a um, demonstration farm on the island uh, of which we have total control over the facility. Uh, we have research trials. Uh, we conduct either individually or as a team and also bringing in researchers from the other islands to assist us in this endeavor. Next. So the goal was to create 22 new farmers um, if achieved, we would double the number of farmers in Holy Hua. Um, the main objective was to do hands-on. Um, and this is a debate we had through the entire program. Um, I'm really into classroom training, theory, science, and my, my colleagues saying, learn by doing, they gotta get out in the field. I said, well, you can do learn by doing, but if they don't have the science, they can't diagnose the problems. And to me, that was a real important thing. So I spent a lot of time writing up curriculum, making sure that they can understand that it's at a level that they can comprehend. The second thing we're looking at was um, hoping that they all, don't all go out there and buy $40,000 tractors. So we tried to set up a, a rental program. Uh, this is still going on. We have some equipment. We're trying to expand on it. Um, and then to teach them how to use different equipment. We have a lot of equipment at the station that we're able to move uh, to the land. And I can explain the program a little bit more in the next slide. So the justification for the project, we have over 7,800 acres of flat agriculture land in this area. Um, and the Hawaiians have two thirds prior rights to the water. Uh, it's something that I spent a lot of time on fighting for our water rights. Less than 5% of the land is in agriculture production and knowledge in agriculture has been identified as a major impediment to increased production. But like anything else in agriculture, the land is only one piece of the puzzle. You have water, you have the knowledge, you have markets, um, you have the business aspects and you need to be able to teach them all of this. Next. And the farm population is aging like anywhere else. Okay, this is Holy Hua, nice flat land, very windy. You can actually tell the farmers because they always lean forward when they walk. Um, access to land under control of their immediate family. Many of them have 35 acre lots. 
Um, all of these are prerequisites. We really didn't want to deal with the infrastructure issues. They had land, they had water, um, and they needed to have a half acre prepared, uh, ready to plant. This meant not a whole lot of trees on it. And we made it real stringent where you had to have less than two years experience. We didn't want to have experienced farmers in there um, kind of dominating the conversation. So we, uh, we really made it stringent. Next. So some of the demographics, the island is uh, 260 square miles, 10 by 38, population of about 8,000 people on a good day. A lot of people travel between the islands, even on boat sometimes, um, but not too much right now. Highest unemployment, cost of living. I saw some figures recently of 85% higher, the state of Hawaii, 85% higher than the national average. We must be like over 100% higher. Uh, very interesting ethnicity on this island, 65% um, Hawaiian, 25% Filipino uh, from the pineapple industry that used to be here. Uh, the pineapple closed, one plantation closed in 1976, the second in about 1982, uh, 17,000 acres of pineapple. 60% um, of the workforce was out of a job, they were out of a job. We have a very small service and tourism industry, no fast foods, no building over two stories high. And the major employment is government and agriculture. It's interesting because this was one of the first places where uh, corn production took place in the 60s, where we had uh, winter, winter plantings. So small um, farms in the Midwest, uh, family farms mostly would come over here, plant in around August, uh, come over and pollinate um, around Christmas time, which was really great for them as they dealt with four foot of snow back in Nebraska and Illinois. Um, and so the, uh, the, one of the main industries in Hawaii is still um, GMO corn, Monsanto, and there's a couple of new ones. One, the Chinese bought out Dow, and I think there's another one. So we have one of them on uh, Molokai Bear, well, formerly Monsanto, but Bear. Um, we're part of Maui County, so decisions are made there. However, we have a strong community bottom-up decision-making. And as I mentioned earlier, rural, no buildings over two stories, no fast foods or chain stores. Um, we have some signs out in the front of the uh, restaurant, slow food. <laughs> um, everyone knows everyone. Uh, strong Hawaiian identity and activism. We're like the, the bellwether island for activism in the state. Uh, and we have the largest concentration of ancient Hawaiian fish ponds. Probably the largest one is about 500 acres. And this island anciently was known as Aina Momona or the fat land. Next. So our participant, participants range in age from, age from about the mid twenties to the early fifties. A lot of small families like this one. Next. And for uh, some of them, it was generational. They, their parents were always uh, also farming and they were also farming. And this is one, one example. Next. So the strategy was classroom, but at the same time, a lot of demonstration, a lot of hands-on um, mentoring by us. Um, all of us have background in agriculture. So we mentored individuals, uh, we consoled. This was an important part of the program. We were involved with uh, social workers early in the program because we didn't wanna have to deal with um, family issues such as drugs or abuse and those kind of things. So we kind of screened them uh, in that way to make sure that um, nothing was holding them back from being successful in farming. Uh, the counseling was really interesting. We had, um, Jennifer Hawkins did a lot of the counseling in the office. Our office is right next to the host office, right in the Hawaiian, Hawaiian homes area. And this is a highest traffic area because everybody picks up their mail from the post office. And this was by design, um, actually designed the office and um, secured the land and secured the money to build our office right next to the post office. So this is one of our, um, one of our farmers he is now our farm to school extension agent on the island, works in the schools, um, trying to move some of our farm um, 
our food, farm food into the schools, into schools and also teaching um, students how to farm. Okay, next. So the carrot, it was real interesting because we really wanted to get them into the business aspects and they were heen and hawing. I said, you have to do a production map. Oh, we don't need a production map. I said, you have to do a production map. So they were all grumbling and stuff. And I said, okay, here's the deal. You do your production map and we will bankroll your half acre demonstration project. So, you know, buy all the supplies, the fertilizer, the drip irrigation, all our areas, all, um, irrigated it's a very dry area maybe 40 to 60 inches of rain except in the last month when we probably had over 40 to 60 inches of rain uh some days we had actually had two inches in r so i don't know if you folks heard about the big storms over here but it's just radical yesterday we had 50 mile an hour winds in the last month we would have three episodes of 50 mile an hour winds um so it was interesting they all jumped through the hoop to um to get that uh, funding for their half acre project. In addition, we cleared another half acre uh, for them after they completed the program. Next. So the high, whole idea was for them to do incremental plantings, um, you know, a little each, each month or each week. Uh, we had markets set up for them in the stores. Uh, some of them were growing papayas and we had them marketing to Whole Foods. Uh, so where do, you, do they learn? Um, in the back of a truck. <laughs> Next. Next, okay. This is probably getting stuck a little bit. Um, in the field, we have a lot of field workshops. What we do is um, we'll visit each other's farms and they would, they would kind of pick up on each other's uh, work that they're doing, a lot of different crops, a lot of walking in in the office. And uh, that was really important. We really wanted to deal with them um, in the office. Uh, some of them would get very dependent on us, you know, come, come in and ask questions. And I, I would just look at them and not say anything. Uh, and they would realize that, okay, we had that in the class. I said, yes, we had that in the class. Read your notes. So you don't want to create dependence. You want to create independence and you want to create interdependence. Uh, the Hawaiian community is really strong in interdependence. Some of these um, individuals have lived next to each other for five generations, which is really unique in Hawaii. Next. So this teachable moment and extension is really important. You want to have that moment. Um, they'll come to you and they'll mention something and boom, you say, okay, I got to teach them this right now. Um, and that I think that was really important to have that kind of relationship with them. Um, they would learn how to run the tractor and, and lime their fields. In fact, we showed this uh, presentation to uh, the dean in Honolulu and she goes, whose tractor is that? I said, oh, that's our tractor. What are they doing running these tractors? Liability, that's the university was freaking out on a liability, but we had to work um, out of the box and look at what would work to teach them. Next. So field diagnostics was really important for them to know um, how to identify diseases, viruses, and things of this nature. So I would go out in the field, they were growing different crops on different farms and we could show them all the different diseases and stuff. Next. Uh, teaching them seedling mixes, bent, how to make benches for their greenhouses. This is um, down at the demonstration farm. We have uh, 28 acres there. We're dealing with a deer problem now. The last thing I heard, we had 350 deer in the, in the farm. Um, so I think a lot of shooting is going on over there right now. Next. Um, teaching them incremental plantings. This is something more conventional, but in Hawaii, this can be a problem at times because if you have an insect or a disease problem, it just goes right down the field. But we just wanted to teach them the importance of being consistent. Next, identifying viruses is really important. Um, and I, st I still reflect on a time when uh, Rosario Providenti and um, Dennis Gonzalez came to um, Molokai. I think they're on their way back from China um, 
looking for um, some resistant, I think, I think it was zucchini yellows resistant um, cucumbers and stuff. So he came to Molokai and he was looking at some uh, peppers and I said, this is a virus. And he said, no, that is not a virus. I said, this is a virus. And at the end of the day, he finally admitted that was a virus. Uh, so viruses can be real a problem in Hawaii, especially in our area where it's really dry. We don't deal with a lot of diseases per se, but we deal with a lot of viruses. Next. Um, they needed to learn all the little things about repairing things, repairing their main line right here. We repairing a two inch um, uh, main line. So they needed to learn every aspect of farming. Next. Uh, they installed all their own drip irrigation. We helped them with the design. We had an Excel program developed by um, uh, one, of our, one of our team. So they could um, put their, together how, how big their field was gonna be and they could design their drip irrigation. Next. This was class one. Um, we had a lot of fun working with these guys. Um, what is interesting about the cohort is they became lifelong uh, friends. They got real close, they would share. One thing interesting about the online community, um, especially this team is that they're willing to share what they're doing. There's no secrets. Um, and this is not every man for himself. They're willing to help um, each other. Next. Now, this is um, another one of our farmers, John Freeman. He was doing papaya and all kinds of different crops and um, very innovative. His uh, uncle had a sweet potato farm, so he kind of understood the uh, basics of growing, uh, growing crops. And he was doing uh, organic papaya and doing a really good job at it. I think there's one more slide on this picture. So class one, we had 14 participated. Um, we had a high percentage of female. In fact, we had at least nine um, couples in the group, which I thought worked really well. We really were pushing for family type um, programs because that way you can make the um, education more generational. 42% uh, started farming. We had all kinds of different crops. Um, we had butternut squash. Uh, John here grew butternut squash during the winter months after the fresh stuff start, uh, stopped coming to Hawaii. Mentoring of class two by class one, a very important aspect of the program. Next. Okay, that's, so John, everybody kind of had a different quote for us. Um, and John used to mention, sometimes I would go on his farm and I said, you got a problem here. You know, you got these viruses, you're not controlling them. You got to cull out the plants. And, and he, he usually took it in, in stride. You know, he realized that I wasn't there to hurt him. I'm trying to help him. So he, he talked about that. Um, even when he started farming full time, he said, well, everybody's telling me I should plant a half acre of papaya. I said, do not plant a half acre of papaya. Start at a quarter and work your way up. So what does he do? He plants a half acre. And every time I see him, and it's another picture of him. So you could go on that one. Um, Every time I saw him, he was like running around with a chicken without, like a chicken without a head. And I told him, I told you, you know, now you, you got the farm controlling you. You're not controlling the farm. So the next year he shifted back to a um, quarter acre. And every time I saw him, everything was going great. So I think it's this, this idea of how much they can handle is really important. Next. Okay, so he, he had organic papaya. We have a bunch of uh, homesteaders growing organic papaya. We're the only ones that can grow organic because we don't have the papaya ring spot on our island and it's rampant on the other island. So the other islands have to grow the genetically mo modified um, papaya. Next. Um, some farmers were trying all kinds of stuff. This is Michael Buchanan. He was, um, every time we taught a different crop, he wanted to grow that crop. And I said, you gotta focus. So. He was doing strawberries, he was doing uh, bulb onions, and he also was doing aquaponics. Okay, next. Uh, we had some really interesting farmers. This is one of them, um, Cara Caparita. She is um, half Filipino, half Hawaiian, and she had all these herbs, uh, especially the Filipino ones, none of which I've, saw, I've seen before. 
she goes, I got all these herbs. I got to grow herbs. I said, right on, you know, and she was learning to farm for the first time. So it was a real challenge. But what she did was she got a lot of uh, family and friends involved in her farm. So some of the, the class two, we had 16 participated, 37% female, 50% completed their production map. Um, I think we got some more data for this page. 50% started farming and they were being mentored by the agents as well as the class one. Um, so Cora was one of them that every time she wanted a, a question answered, she would come to the office and I would just look at her. I wouldn't say anything. He goes, oh, okay, it's in the papers. I said, yeah, it's in the paper. Uh, you, you Again, you don't want them to be um, dependent on you. You wanna really push their independence and their interdependence. Next. We had one farmer, um, he's, his wife is Hawaiian and he's Samoan and his wife would call up every year, every year, oh, I want my husband, husband to be in the program. And this is another Hawaiian homes community about seven miles away, but I didn't want to uh, have the tractors run on the highway. So I kept on holding back. She finally just kept on bugging me and allowed them to, um, to be in the program. And he was a really good farmer. Um, he made value-added products with um, this taro, uh, uh, something called lao lao, which is a delicacy in Hawaii. It's um, a pork wrapped with taro leaves. And he was actually mailing it to the mainland, to college students on the mainland. This guy was trying all kinds of stuff and uh, he was really successful. Okay, next. And um, this taro, this is the same farm. This taro grew about eight foot, eight feet tall. Um, and we, by, by growing in these different areas, we really found out what can grow. And we couldn't assume his neighbor was growing ca um, head cabbage. And this is at um, sea level. And I said, this cabbage is not gonna grow here. It's too hot. And the, we, we grew some old um, French varieties and they grew really well. Next. Next one. Okay, so they learned a lot of different techniques. Um, this was planting the herbs, the Filipino herbs, teaching them how to use different uh, types of equipment. Uh, they involved their cousins and friends, uh, which was really good in setting up uh, a lot of the farm. And then this multiplier effect of learning. So you had all these um, individuals, some of whom actually went to community college after this experience. Next. Um, cover crops is really important. Um, really pushing them to understand the different cover crops. We have a big nem uh, root knot nematode problem um, on Molokai, so you needed to do crop rotation. This is sun hemp. The other one we use is um, sorghum Sudan. There's only a few crops that have real strong uh, tolerance to root knot nematode, especially our strain of Melodagine, Melodagine, Javonica. Okay, next. Uh, we had some farmers doing organic watermelon. It was real interesting because uh, they, uh, on Oahu, they make this organic fertilizer. It's from um, all the spoiled meat from the big boxes, such as Sam's Place and Costco, as well as the fish market. We have a lot of fish coming in from the Pacific. So these guys would buy all this material, or probably get given to them. They would compress it and sh um, pull out the oils and use their, the oils to run their equipment and they would dry and, and dehydrate, steam and dehydrate this material. And we would buy it and bring it to the island in um, one ton sacks. So this guy, I said, we should try injecting it through the line. So what we did was he mixed up molasses and worm castings and it worked. And so the researcher at UH said, no way. I said, come check it out. So they came over and what was interesting about that, first, they couldn't believe it, but second, they were able to refine the process um, and we didn't need to use the molasses and part, you know, the bubbling up of the process. We used uh, worm castings and we were able to bubble it up overnight. It'll break it down. We just had to use really good filters. So we 
we didn't get any of this material in the drip line. Next. And this is some of the watermelon. You, you can sell it on the island for 50 cents a pound. You made a whole lot of money off of this one. Next. Uh, we had broccoli. Most of the crop uh, was for Molokai. Some of it went off island. Some of uh, such as taro went to Maui. Okay, next. Uh, and we decided to run this pollinator um, education program. Um, Molokai at one time was the big capital of the honey capital of the world back in the 1930s. We had a lot of honey production here. Um, and we lost the market uh, in the 19, late 1930s because our market was Germany and the war started. Um, and it's interesting because USDA didn't want us to do bees. They didn't feel that bees were a crop, but I think it was really important in terms of pollination of our cucurbits and other crops. Um, we had 10, uh, two rounds, 10 participants each, 20 total. Half of them came out of the beginning farmer program and half of them were, were new homesteaders. Uh, excellent, excellent program. Um, we have a lot of different bees in the different areas um, and they all learn how to collect bees from the wild. And it's interesting because some of the bees are really wild and some of them are real docile. And so one day they were going out to the West End to uh, collect the hive. And I knew it was a wild one, so I didn't show up. Uh, and they all got stung. <laughs> I bumped into them at the store later in the day. They said, oh, we all got stung. They just were attacking us. And I said, yeah, I kind of expected that one. But it was this giant ball of a hive. Next. And this is important, especially since uh, although we don't have a raw mite on this island, we do have the small beehive beetle. So it's a whole new way of raising bees. Now you need to check them all the time. You need to make sure they got enough food. You may need to plant pollinators in the uh, nectar sources in the field. So they learn all of this and they did a lot of this stuff. Next. So this is using buckwheat to uh, attract the bees to the field. Uh, we even figured out the timing on how soon to plant it before uh, the crop would be planted. Next. And this is a watermelon field in, um, this is um, my homestead. Uh, so you, a lot of times the bees are not in the area. You wanna be able to get them in the area before the pollinating is needed. Um, and this field did really well. No, I, no misshaped fruits, misshapen fruits. Okay. Um, one of our uh, beginning farmers started making honey. This is the mesquite honey, considered some of the best in the world. Uh, he won two awards, statewide awards. One was the best honey in the year one. And the second, he won um, People's Choice Award for the second year, Hawaii Natural Honey Competition. He has another honey uh, made from mangrove that is golden color, beautiful. Next. So survey of communication methods. Um, Cell phone was really important in communicating with us. They're always calling us up when they had a problem. 60% um, used email. Some of them used no email, which was a real problem for us. 60% um, stopped by the office, which was positive. We really wanted this to happen and make this a, a habit. Next. So survey of learning methods, 70% learn best through field activities. And this is real common for the native um, Hawaiian community. They want to touch, they want to feel. That's that's real important part of the culture. And 90% of the participants rated the program excellent. Next. So lesson learned, understanding the clientele, their needs and learning level was really important in developing the program. Um, steady feedback, always like, how was that class? Did you learn a lot? How should we change it? Um, do you need a, um, one more of that class? So, and the co cohorts worked really well and created lasting bonds. It was really funny because in Hawaii, in Hawaiian culture, there's really important events. One is um, a one-year-old uh, 
party for the baby because in the past, I guess a lot of them didn't make one year. So one year old party, graduation, more common, more now, I guess, graduation, marriage and death. So one of them was having a, a graduation party. She goes, oh, I'm having a graduation party and I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna do. And that was it. The members of the class, one gave them a pig, the other one gave them the taro leaves. Somebody made them poi and she had almost all the ingredients for her party. And these parties on the island, I mean, pretty much the whole island comes to some of these parties. Um, so the strong interdependence ethic, we were able to capitalize on that. That was really important. Um, the extension approach of here, see, do is very important. This whole extension um, methods are critical. And this job was, beyond the regular duties of extension, definitely. I mean, we're stepping into new areas. We're not supposed to do constantly. We're not counselors. Um, we're mentors We're mentors in a certain way, but we went a little beyond that and really sitting down with them and helping them to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. Next. Okay, so post-grant activities. Uh, I, I've been doing a monthly newsletter changed to quarterly up to about, I think about a year and a half ago, um, I ran out of gas. There's too much stuff going on. Um, I'll probably do a few more before I retire at the end of this year. Next. Um, we created a new farmers cooperative. Um, it's still a work in progress. Organizations are really a challenge in Hawaii uh, on Molokai, but they, um, this, this ethic of interdependence works right into this. Um, we have some equipment, we're trying to expand the cooperative right now. We have partnerships with a lot of nonprofits to assist us in the effort of grant writing and training. Uh, we um, secured a $40,000 uh, USDA business grant. Um, we're still trying to work on this because we're bringing a lot of the green waste out of the landfill and then composting it. Um, this has been a work in progress a lot of the farmers were actually clearing land and making biochar, which worked out really nice. Um, and we received other grants uh, to help us on this effort. We're still working with these groups. It, um, it's kind of expanded. We've gone into gardening during COVID. A lot of requests for, um, for gardening. We also have our resource library in the office, but I think now with internet, we may not need that but I think some of them are still old style. They still wanna read a book. Um, and we have ongoing one-on-one -on -one technical assistance for this group, as well as everybody else on the island. Next. So collaborators, really important in a rural community. We have a supply cooperative actually started by Hawaiian homesteaders back in the 1970s, brings in most of the supplies they need. Um, very important. Uh, we have a Molokai, Community College Farm, which we actually created with Maui Community College, and it's a joint facility, which we also run our demonstration farm. The B project, um, UHB project from Manoa, uh, provided a lot of technical support. We had a, a producer on the island wanting to teach others to do it. We also had, had um, access to Homesteaders Association tractor service. Again, trying to stay away from buying tractors. Um, trying to maximize the use of equipment in the community. We have a USDA plant material center right on the edge of the Hawaiian homelands that we're able to um, work with, learning how to use cover crops and other and native plants as pollinators. Uh, Molokai Community Services Center, uh, we run grants through them. Um, USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service programs, we, we had them hook up to the programs such as cost sharing for wind breaks and irrigation systems. We also had them um, hook up with uh, Farm Service Agency, which I think we didn't list over here. Uh, Department of Hawaiian Homelands funded a position, which is my old position. Um, and we had Manoa-based faculty assisting in the effort. Kohala Center is another grant writing agency. And we also has had assistance from the County of Maui Office of Economic Development. Uh, of, this center on Molokai is one of the centers we actually developed as well uh, with the County of Maui uh, Business Assistance Center. Next. So this is getting to the last slide. We try to um, 
let the community know what's going on. I have access to the local newspaper. I, I used to write articles almost every week at times, kind of slowed down right now. And everybody's grumbling about grumbling at me, telling me, where's the articles? Where are the articles? Um, usually if there's something going on that's really a problem, um, I'll write an article. If I, if I walk around a store and three people ask about the same thing, um, that's usually an indication that I have to write an article. Uh, next. So the fruits. So we had people making all kinds of stuff. We had watermelon and papayas. We had aquaponics, taro. Um, next. So we had a lot of new ground being opened. Uh, we had heavy equipment to come in and open up these new fields. Next. Um, a lot of hands-on, creating the next generation of farmers. Next. And that is the end of my presentation. I didn't even time it. It was only 30 minutes. Any questions, comments? It's getting uh, unmuted and off the screen share, Glenn. Thank you so much for uh, a fantastic presentation and also uh, for doing it as a, a, a dawn presentation uh, from Hawaii, uh, you know, the long, uh, many time zones away. Uh, I, I'm sorry uh, you couldn't see me cracking up at your jokes, but um, that'll be again soon. Um, so I have a bunch of things I could ask, but I think if we can uh, uh, open it up for, I think, uh, uh, questions in the chat, if, if you just kind of get in line there. And so I'll, I'll read them, but if you want to, if anybody wants to um, kind of ask in person or your voice, just kind of interrupt me and, and go. So Marvin Pritz asked with the, about the, the history of land use in the sites that are being opened for agriculture. What, what, what were they before? Okay, a lot of them, our area was in pineapple. There are 17,000 acres in pineapple. Um, on other, er, other islands, um, sugar took up a lot of the space. So the lands are open from uh, sugar Sugar, the last sugar plantation closed, I think about three years ago on Maui. That was, I can't even remember the amount of land. I wanna say 14,000, but I think it's more than that. Uh, so every island had large uh, production. Um, and somebody made up, uh, yeah, the pineapple was really hard on the soil. And that's why I think when we came to some of these areas, like in Holy Hua, you had to really build it up. Uh, you may have had herbicides, uh, we were able to overcome the herbicide problems with um, nitrogen, just getting the microbes working in the soil, adjusting the pH, bringing it back from the low levels of like 6 point, uh, well, 4.5 to 5.5, bringing it up to 6.4. Um, so yeah, and then organic matter, trying to get the organic matter up. And kind of interesting because recently we did a whole bunch of soil samples for the papaya guys. And a lot of them were up at five, and I was really surprised. I didn't expect that. Um, but yeah, land use. Um, the land is really expensive. Um, you know, you have this pressure to develop. Everybody wants a home in Hawaii, and it's gotten really crazy now with COVID because now you can work wherever you want, and a lot of people want to move to Hawaii. So the land prices are just skyrocketing. You can buy a house for a million dollars. Um, you can buy a farm. You can buy a one acre lot for a million dollars. So the pressure uh, is, uh, is really creating a problem in Hawaii. I mean, even farmers with land today, they're getting surrounded by expensive houses. And now the, those individuals are grumbling. Why are you starting your tractor at five o'clock in the morning? And what is that dust? And what is that noise? And it's just creating havoc for farming in Hawaii. Um, and so there's a lot of backlash right now. People are saying, we need to farm, we need food security. We produce 15% um, of our food. We depend on this um, barge system to bring food in. We're running into shortages right now. I went to the store last week, the day after the produce came in and the, most of the produce was gone. So we're running into major problems right now uh, with the food system. 
um, nationwide. And it seems like a lot of these big corporations are trying to make their money back. So the prices are going up real fast um, and it's creating a problem. And not only that, buying up some of the small places and losing a lot of the ma and pa um, stores and stuff around. Okay. I see uh, Thomas Bjorkman has a, a, a question and he's appeared. So I think he probably wants to ask it. Sure, okay. thanks. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of a lot of what you're describing is is been happening in the peri urban areas of New York as well. Yes, <laughs> With the yes. People moving out and the land prices going up and trying to make money off of that. Uh, so I I'm actually curious about one of the trade offs that they seem to handle well. So on the one hand, you have a desire for self sufficiency and cultural yes. reinforcement. And then on the other hand, for the last 150 years or so, the worst job in the world, the one nobody wants, mm -hmm. is subsistence farmer. Right. People have really voted with their feet on that one. So you don't want to be training people to be subsistence farmers who are unhappy and wish they were doing anything else. How did you handle that trade-off? Well, see, on Hawaiian homelands, subsistence is important. Yeah. Um, and if you know how to do it, you can create a lot of production out of subsistence. Uh, you have um, agroforestry type systems, you got permaculture systems. Um, and in Hawaii, I've seen some two acre um, gardens that are just super productive. Uh, so for some people, they can kind of move from subsistence into production, small scale production. Mm -hmm. The ones to me that have really excelled are the ones where one partner is working and getting the medical and everything and the other yeah. one is farming that seems to be um you know um multiple income the right. myths right. that seems to be the one working a lot um there's a new food system being developed in hawaii by farmers uh food hubs this kind of thing getting the food directly to the people but what's interesting right now is that since COVID is going open opening back up people are going back to their old ways they're going back to the big boxes. They're going back and they're not buying from the farmers like they right. did before. Right. So that's a real, that's a real problem because I think the farmers had a real opportunity. They had to really ramp up to cover the needs. And now they got to ramp down because everybody's going back to their same old, same old ways. So I, I don't know what the, yeah. what the answer is. I mean, I think what I see happening and on our island, we have a um, mobile market. So um, Sunday afternoon, you tell them what you got, portions, you know, you got bags of tomatoes, whatever. You tell them, okay, I got, I got 25 half pound bags of tomatoes. And this all goes onto the internet. And Monday morning, it gets posted and everybody on the island orders. Nice. And then on Tuesday, you got to print out and the prices are really high. I mean, I can sell my tomatoes That's for great. seven. Seven fifty a pound. <laughs> I was selling green onions. I had this Hawaiian green onion wow. that was actually going for twenty dollars a pound. Um, but a lot of them are the uh, snowbirds. They come mm -hmm. over in the winter time. Right. But a lot of the snowbirds didn't come this year because they got stuck right. at home. So, but but how do you feed? How do you feed the masses? Is the is the million dollar question? I think. And we we still trying to figure that one out. Right. Right, the commodity stuff can come in. I mean, the the difference in shipping from Rochester to New York or Guanajuato to New York, yeah, it's it's not that different. So <laughs> you have a little more isolation. Well, <laughs> but, California is right here. But it's right yeah, here, you know? right. It's, see, so, it's interesting. You know, I mean, it's the system is interesting because we had two big hurricanes on Kauai: Hurricane Eva and Hurricane Iniki. And I think after the first hurricane, the state uh, did this study to look at how much food was in Hawaii. And at that time, they estimated about 21 days worth of food because they had all this storage capacity, warehouses and stuff like that. Since then, the big boxes came to town and there's no storage capacity. And all the storage is on these container ships between California and Hawaii. So now we have seven days worth of food, which is really scary. Um, and so if you're not farming, I mean, you better be doing something. We have a real strong subsistence ethic on this island, hunting and fishing. We got a lot of fish. We're one of the only islands with a whole lot of fish. Uh, we have deer coming out of our ears right now, getting tired of eating deer. 
although I might have some deer burgers for dinner tonight. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Did I answer that question? I think. No, great. Okay, great. great. A lot of, lot of insight. Okay. And, uh, and uh, Underhill, uh, if we go back in order, uh, uh, wonders a little bit about uh, could you, do you think you could replicate what you're doing without such an interconnected culture? Um, it all comes down to trust. Okay, you know, I, I used to think that land grant was the best thing since motherhood and apple pie until I understood what land grant really meant. And it was pushing the natives out and taking over their land and genocide and removal, the National Removal Act of moving them out of New York and taking them to Oklahoma and every place else. So you have this hurt that's really hard to overcome. And I think it'll really differ between one native group and another and how open they are. Some of them, um, it, it's, more than, it's more than teaching. It's about healing, about getting them to understand um, the modern system. Some of them will not buy into the modern system. They won't buy into capitalism. So you only can take them from where they are to where they wanna be. So it really depends on that. Did I did I understand? Uh, did I explain that one? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Uh, I think Marley uh, is next. Hi, I really enjoyed your seminar talk. I was wondering. I know you talked about some of the crops that farmers are growing and interested in, but were there any that were particularly culturally uh, important? And if any of those were needing like breeding efforts, uh, especially like different like squash or gourds? Um, the, probably the most important one is taro. Uh, what's interesting about the Hawaiians is that they had at least four staples when they came from, I guess, Taiwan to Polynesia um, 6,000 years ago. They were the, old, uh, the new kids on the, uh, the block there were people in the Pacific already, the Melanesians um, from New Guinea, actually coming down the land bridge through um, Indonesia to New Guinea, down to the um, Gilbert Islands and down to Australia. So those guys were around probably 20,000, maybe even longer. Um, so when the, when the Polynesians, they were called Austronesians and they came into the Pacific, what allowed them to come into the Pacific was an innovation called the double hull canoe. Prior to that, they all had single hull canoes that would flip over in the waves. So they came in with the double hull canoe and they knew they were gonna have a hard time. So they actually brought along the way four different staples. So these four staples are um, taro, sweet potato, breadfruit, and cooking bananas. And probably the most important ones were um, taro number one, and sweet potato number two. So taro could grow in the wetter areas, the river valleys. Sweet potato would grow in some of the really dry areas. Um, we've done some work on sweet potato trying to identify new varieties, but there's a strong movement towards um, back to the ancient varieties. Um, in fact, um, the University of Hawaii tried to do some genetic modification. Well, they were trying to patent taro. They were crossing some taro from the South Pacific with the Hawaii taro to develop um, Phytophthora leaf blight resistance. And there was a huge backlash. Um, so I think, you know, you have that side of it where they still want their ancient foods and they don't want it genetically modified. So you can do um, conventional breeding. We've done some of that stuff, um, but it has to taste as good as the other stuff. And so far it hasn't. So you're gonna build, build up and you're gonna pick up resistance to something, but the taste is not gonna be there. Or the, um, and the, what's important about taro is um, they used to dry it. And then when, it, when they needed to um, use it, they could add water and it would ferment and it would last a long time. But this fermentation um, helped to digest all the other foods they ate. So they would get total, I guess, total use of all the food they ate. And today we deal a lot with diabetes and stuff like that. It was real interesting. And I saw this article recently um, talking about um, the genetics of 
Polynesians. And they were very thrifty um, genetics. So they didn't need to eat a lot of food. So today you have the starches, you have the Western foods and they cannot handle. You know, they're, they're doing really bad in this regard. So this idea of going back to um, native foods is really important. And I've been Rick working uh, with Washington in the last three weeks on trying to push an indigenous foods initiative. Um, what, what you need to push is something that every state can support. You can't push this pork barrel stuff for your state. And this is something that we could push for a lot of states. A lot of states could buy into this indigenous foods. So this has a lot of pieces to the puzzle. You need the genetics. You need to continue having the old varieties of squash and corn and those kind of things. Then you need to um, get them into production. And then you need to get their food, this food into their food system. So I'm, I'm working on a grant right now um, with one of our representatives. Um, I have a classmate that work, has worked in Washington for 40 years. So I usually in touch with him and throwing ideas out to him. And he usually sends me texts about his garden, how, if I can help him with his garden. So I was on text with him on Saturday for an hour. Um, so I think that's one area. You, you can do improvement, but it's gotta be acceptable by them. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Glenn. I think we are unfortunately about out of time. Uh, oh, you you are uh, uh, doing so many things. Uh, thank you for coming and sharing uh, some of them with us. Um, and I hope to to get you back uh, to talk seeds at some point. Uh, and so, uh, looking forward to more uh, connections with you, especially since you'll be coming to uh, New York now and then. Oh yes, I will, and I gotta connect with you. I know you, you um, told me, hey, you know, stop by, and so I wanna, I wanna get that together soon. Let's do it. Well, thank okay. you so much for a great talk, Glenn. It was, uh, it was fantastic, and I look forward to more chances to connect. Okay, Mike. Well, take care. Hello. Yeah. Bye. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.